an avid hunter, was in the uh, market for a new bird dog. Uh, his search ended uh, when he found a dog that could actually walk on the water and retrieve a bird. Shocked by his find, he thought, nobody's going to believe me. So he invited a friend, a rather pessimistic friend, uh, to go hunting with him. So they went out on a particular day, and they both fired simultaneously, and a duck fell. And sure enough, the dog springs into action, leaps in the water, but doesn't sink. Actually walks across the water, retrieves the duck, comes back. Only his paws wet. The friend said nothing. So as they were driving home, uh, the uh, duck hunter asked his uh, pessimistic friend, uh, did you notice anything special today about my dog? And the man said, I sure did. Your dog can't swim. <laughs> Some people just don't get the point. <laughs> My prayer is today as you're turning to 1 John chapter 1, you will get the point, and that point will be given uh, at the uh, end of the sermon. But listen carefully to 1 John 1, 5 through 7, and see if you can start to detect what the point might be. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer, please? Father, love your word. And I'm thankful, Lord. I know there are a group here memorizing uh, 1 John and strengthen them as they do so. Uh, Father, we thank you for last week's message as we could, um, concern, concern, con, uh, Father, contemplate, uh, Father, just John's experience of coming in contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, Lord, as we think about the God of light, would you just turn on the light for us? We call it illumination. Help us to clearly understand what is before us today. Guide us as only you can. Speak to each heart personally and powerfully. Uh, your servant asks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Glenn Barker uh, writes, If the readers are to have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, that's God's Son, they must understand what makes this possible. What is it that makes it possible for us to have fellowship with the Father and the Son and with one another? And you might recall from last week, I gave you the breakdown for the book, two major parts. And the first part is 1 John 1, 1 through 2, 27, and it's the reasons for fellowship. The reasons for fellowship. And today we're going to contemplate some of those reasons. And you'll notice here uh, in verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. Now you have to zero in on the words from him. Who is him referring to? The uh, closest antecedent is Jesus Christ at the end of verse 3. So John says we've heard from him, Jesus Christ, and now we are going to declare to you. Uh, consider this, everyone. How would we ever know about the nature of God if it were not for Jesus Christ? Jesus has been with the Father from eternity past, and that's a long time. And listen to John 1.18, because it shows us that Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. This is John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The Son, Jesus Christ, has come in order that he might tell us about the nature of God. So now John 
describes the one uh, who is the reason, <laughs> if you will, for the fellowship that we have by a positive statement. We're going to get a positive statement and then a negative one saying the same thing. And notice here, God is light. See, God is also love, 1 John 4. Eight. God is a spirit, John 4 in verse 24. But God is light describes his character, and listen carefully, as holy and as pure and as righteous. So God is light. Let's consider the aspect of that light first with holiness. Have you considered how God wraps himself? You know, when we begin the day, we put on clothing. But listen to Psalm 104 and verse 2. Speaking of God, who covers yourself with light as with a garment. <laughs> he has light as a garment. See, he is intrinsically light. It's his nature. Paul writes to Timothy these great words in 1 Timothy 6.16, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. That's why when Moses asked God in Exodus 33, show me your glory, God, please. And the response, no one can see my face and live. Why? Because of God's nature being light. Listen to J. Ronald Blue's statement. Shadows from the sun shift, but not the one who made the sun. And with that said, I want to tell you the second aspect of the God of light, and that is pure. He's pure. Uh, James says it this way in 117, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Have you thought about the sun, S U N and then the S O N, the sun who made the sun we know. The surface temperature of our sun is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. If you get into the core of the sun, it's approximately 27 million degrees. That's hot. Uh, its diameter is 200, excuse me, 870,000 miles. 870,000 miles, which is 109 times greater than that of the Earth. The weight is 330,000 times greater than that of planet Earth. That's remarkable. We did not have a sun into existence until the fourth day of creation. But yet after day one, what did we have? Light. So we had light day one, day two, and day three. But the sun wasn't created until day four. So where did that light come from? And the answer is God. And even in the New Jerusalem, my friends, we're told in Revelation 21, and then again in chapter 22, that there will be no sun because the glory of God will illuminate the new Jerusalem. Is that bright or what? Something else to think about. Throughout the ages, men have worshipped the sun. Uh, there's actually a city, when you read about in the Old Testament, Beth Shemesh. Beth Shemesh. Uh, Shemesh is the Hebrew word for sun. Could it be that God did not create the sun until day four? Because why? Men worship the sun. Just to show that he didn't even need the sun in order to give light to the world. God is light. He's holy. He is pure. And then may I say number three, the S-O-N who made the S-U-N, <laughs> uh, he is righteous. Righteous. Uh, turn with me to the book of Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to pick it up in Ephesians chapter 5, down in verse 8. Ephesians 5, 8. Paul's writing to the saints at Ephesus, for you were once darkness. This word 
were <laughs> continuous action in past time. Before they came to know Jesus Christ continually, they were in darkness. And that was you and me too, was it not? We walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's Ephesians chapter 2. You were once darkness, but now, see right now, nun, at the present time, you are light in the Lord. And since you are light in the Lord, what are we commanded to do? Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. The fruit of the Spirit is characterized as goodness, righteousness, and truth. And that's the one who illuminates us to imitate the God of light. Verse 10 says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. I was a youth pastor 10 years. One of the questions that came my way often is, well, pastor, why is it wrong? Right? Wrong question. The question that we need to turn around and say, why is it right? In Ephesians 5.10, the word finding out is dokimazo. It means to test something to prove it. So we are to examine everything in light of the word of God to see if it is something that God would approve of. Proving what is acceptable to the Lord, and notice in verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. We don't want to give the details. We know there are a lot of ungodly and immoral practices in this world. We don't need to see the pictures. We don't need to hear the descriptions. We know they're wicked. Paul then continues in verse 13, but all things, see, speaking about the secret sins of the verse before, that are exposed or made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Light shows what's there. So as a result of this, notice in verse 14, Paul quotes from the Old Testament and says, awake. That's a present imperative. Keep on waking up. And who is he speaking to? Those who sleep. Cthuzo, your verb, means to be spiritually indifferent. It means to yield to sloth. At times, not even really to care that we are saved or not. Awake you who are spiritually indifferent. And then he gives a verb, but this time in the aorist tense, past time. Once and for all, arise from the dead. And Christ, and notice the future tense verb, will give you light. So how many of you need to wake up spiritually? How many of you need to say, I am spiritually indifferent. I don't care if people are going to hell. I don't care about my brother or sister in Christ. I don't care about the missionaries on the field. I don't care about attending church faithfully as I'm called to do. I don't care about taking my money and using it for the Lord's glory. I don't care. If that is you, dear brother and sister in Christ, Ephesians 5.14 is for you. Awake, that's a command. Keep on waking up, you who are spiritually indifferent, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So we're looking at the nature of God as you're coming back to 1 John, and we see positively stated, God is light. And now we see it stated negatively. Notice the second half of verse 5. You there, 1 John 1, verse 5? And in him is no darkness at all. He's saying the same thing. He's saying positively, God is light. But he's saying when you examine the nature of our God, there's no flaw. It's not 99.9% .9 pure. 100%. Why? He is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Now you're starting to get the idea that if this is the nature of God, than how we need to live in order to have a relationship with him.
Now, I want you to do something. If you mark in your Bible, notice the first few words in verse 6. If we say, let your eyes go down to verse 8. If we say, and then down to verse 10. If we say, I believe what John is doing is exposing the thinking of the false teachers that have permeated the ranks. Because now notice in verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him. See, John is demonstrating that the way the false teachers talk is not how they walk. That the two do not mesh. See, that we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk, and that's a present tense verb, we keep walking in darkness. They're in habitual darkness. So you know what that tells me? They're not born again. The individuals, the false teachers, that are trying to influence the saints say one thing, but then they do another. See, if we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And by the way, let's step back for one second. How can you discern if someone is not walking in the truth? Go over to chapter 2 with me, 1 John 2. Come down to verse 9. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And then down to verse 11. But he who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So there's a test. One of the things I love about 1 John, there are tests given to us to see if we are walking in light, if we are being true to the nature of God. The individuals who are not walking in light but in darkness, notice this, they are the liars and they are not practicing the truth. John 8, 44, Satan is a liar. But stated positively now, listen to Jesus, John chapter 3, verse 21. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. See, John, or what I like about John is like the guy from Missouri. And what's Missouri called? What do you see? Show me state. He's saying, I hear you, but I want to see you. I know what you're saying, but I want to see it in practice. Now, I want you to note here that the false teachers have demonstrated that they are not in the light because, number one, we saw back in verse 6, they walked in darkness. And then, number two, we are now going to see in verse 7, they are neglecting the fellowship with the saints. Verse 7. But if we walk, and it's a present tense verb, but if we keep on walking in the light, as see he, God, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We cannot have fellowship with one another, dear friend, unless we continually walk with the God who is light, who dwells in unapproachable light, and is only possible through his Son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In John 14, and verse 6, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. So if we're walking in the light, as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from some sin. What does it say to everybody? You tell me. All sin. What I find interesting, John doesn't hesitate to mention the blood of Christ. Remember the docetist? The individuals who said Jesus did not have a physical body. Goes back to the verb decao, it seems. 
But yet John points out about the literal blood of Jesus Christ. It cleanses us from all sin. This blood had to be shed in order for you and I to have forgiveness of sin. Hebrews 9 and verse 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. Paul says about our justification being declared righteous in Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood. See, declared righteous by his blood. We'll, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And it's this blood that cleanses us. Over to Hebrews chapter 9 with me, please. Hebrews chapter 9 and come down to verse 12. Speaking about Christ being our high priest, verse 12 says, not with the blood of goats and calves. And notice here it says, but with. With is not your best translation. It's dia. It's the preposition dia with the genitive, which should be translated through. See, but through his own blood, he entered the most holy place. And why do I point out that distinction? Because we have individuals who teach that when Jesus died, his blood was caught, and he literally carried it up to the throne room, you know, to sprinkle the heavenly altar, so to speak. That's not what the text is teaching. It is saying here in verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but through. See, the means for you and I to be declared righteous was through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But through his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all. I love that. Once and for all. That's such a big statement. Because you had 83 high priests who served from the first high priest, Aaron, to the time the temple was destroyed in AD 70. They served, they died. They served, they died. Once and for all having obtained eternal redemption. Now, the writer is going to give us an a fortiori argument, an argument from the lesser to the greater. Look at verses 13 and 14. The lesser. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Remember in the Old Testament, you had animal sacrifices. So that you could have a temporary cleansing. But now notice in verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? See, if the animal sacrifices gave a, a temporary covering, Yom Kippur, it just means a day of atonement, a day of covering. How much more? The shed blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Can you say amen for Jesus going to the cross and shedding his blood for you and me? Amen. What a thing. And he cleanses us, as we're told in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, not from some sin. And notice that the word is singular. That's right. It's all sin. All sin. Your pastor today thanks Jesus Christ for cleansing me from all sin, or I would not be standing before you. <laughs> and you know what you've been through. I know what I've been through. And we all have sinned, and we've come short of the glory of God. <laughs> so I am so thankful when I look at the Word of God, and I know that the sacrifice of Christ has cleansed me, from all sin. And that's why it's such a wonderful thing that Jesus dealt with it at the root. See, sin is singular. <laughs> the idea is when John sees Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away, and is singular again, the sin of the world. That's exactly right. We are cleansed from all sin. Now, may I share the main point with you? I don't have a dog that walks on the water. And if I had a pessimistic friend that just didn't notice that he walked on the water and just says he can't swim, he's not going hunting with me again. Okay. 
The main point is this. Live in God's light for fellowship and cleansing. Live in God's light for fellowship and cleansing. See, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we are liars and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Live in God's light. Do you remember when Jesus said, I'm the light of the world? John 8, 12. Do you remember the occasion? He goes to the temple early in the morning to teach. Can you imagine being in church and then all of a sudden you're teaching and here comes a group of religious people. And they have a woman. I don't know if they threw a towel around her or what they did, but she was caught in adultery in the very act. Where's the man? Kind of wonder if it's always a setup. It was one of own. I've always wondered that. I'll find that out when I get to heaven. And they try to trap Jesus. Remember the story? <laughs> they try to trap him because they say, you know, basically, what should we do? Should we put this person to death? Well, isn't that what the law teaches? You had fornication, you had adultery in the Old Testament, you got put to death. But then if he says, no, 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 that shouldn't be the case here, he has another group of people. Whatever way he turned, he was in trouble. So what does he do? See, you and I would just go, ah, bah, bah, bah. He stoops down and he begins to write on the ground. That's classic. He got to admit, isn't it? <laughs> I know commentators, preachers, teachers who can tell you what he wrote on the ground. I don't know. It doesn't say what he wrote on the ground, but the issue is never, never what he wrote, but how he wrote. He wrote with the finger of God. In Exodus chapter 31, the Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God. And you remember the statement that Jesus makes, because he'd stoop down, he'd write, and they were probably looking at him like, are you a looney tune? Okay? And uh, he says, well, you know what? He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And there's somebody there in their 80s. And they're thinking about all their sin, and he kind of does the Michael Jackson moonwalk, and out he goes. And then the guy's 70 and 60 and 50 and 40 and 40, you know what? They're all gone. Because Jesus' life was given to such light that it just brought conviction to the people around him. And then finally, finally, I love it. There's Jesus and the woman. And what he says, he says, go and sin no more. Your sin has been forgiven you. My best guess, being the omniscient, all-knowing Son of God, that as this activity was transpiring, that this was a lady that was broken and had repented of her sin, and Jesus looked right in her heart, understood what she had done, and said, you go and you sin no more. Being early morning, it was probably still dark outside. But yet in John 8, 12, then we have one of Jesus' I am statements. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Isn't it time, dear friend, that we truly live in the light? And in closing, I'd like you just to turn, it's not on a PowerPoint, but Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, please. And come on down to verse 14 with me.
been in this world coming up upon my sixth decade, and um, it only gets darker. I can remember when, you know, heterosexual marriage was the norm in the United States. And boom, overnight, what do we have? Gay marriage and propagate, and around the world we have those kind of things going on. And you start to think about the deterioration that has taken place just in the United States alone. And now in the Philippines and other places, gay marriage is being pushed. And, you know, it, this, this, this thing is just spreading rampantly. And I'm going, OK. You know, we can do a few things. We can become political people. We can watch the news, and we can get mad, and we can yell at our politicians. <laughs> you talk to your TV. Every once in a while, I talk to my TV. So I try not to watch too much. And you know, some of us need to speak up. You know, I'm in the state of Maryland, and I remember when the gay marriage issue came up. And you know, we have some churches with 10, 15, 20,000 folk. And I can remember back in the day when the black community did not accept homosexuality at all. It wasn't that long ago, right? You remember? You remember? And the churches were silent. You know, where were the marches with 10,000 people going down to Annapolis and saying, you know what? You vote that way. We're not voting for you next time. But no, we were quiet. There's a problem with us at times being quiet. See, this is the reality. Yes, Jesus is the light of the world. But he's tagged you. He has tagged me and says, now, you're it. But we watch our TV, we have a little huddle, and we, we you know, get in our little cliques or little groups. But do we fast? Do we pray like Daniel who saw wickedness in the world in which he lived? Have such convictions that are lies because they're so holy and so pure. Bring conviction to those around us. In Matthew 5.14, Jesus says, you are, and that's emphatic. The emphasis is on you. And I want to say to you today, it's you. Jesus has taken a baton. He's already run his leg, so to speak. He's at the right hand of the Father, ever living to pray for us. So, you know, he's, he's a vital part of everything. But he's handed you the baton. And he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor, nor did they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Man, we've been saved that we might serve. We are God's poem, is what it says in Ephesians 2.10, created. In God, under good works, our lives should testify to the light of God. That light now should shine through our faces and through our lives because we are living holy, separated from the world, and when people see us, they know there's something different about us. That's the idea of us now living in God's light for fellowship and cleansing. And would you bow your heads and would you close your eyes and would you ask yourself this honest question? Now that I've been tagged, am I living like I'm it? Are you so connected to Jesus Christ that as the world around you sees your life, they see his light? So some of us are sitting here going, okay. I've got to make some changes. Because I've not been in the light as I need to be in the light. And I understand now that if I live in God's light, I get fellowship and cleansing. Are you ready to walk into the light? Are you ready to say, Jesus Christ is going to be such a priority in my life. I want to read that word. I want to pray. And I want to be the one that I understand now that I've been tagged. I'm it. And I want to go out and live like it. If that's your desire, child of God, would you simply shoot up that hand and say, Pastor, I want to be it.
I want to be in. God bless you.